Well, hi everybody. Um, I'm back to give you a quick little mini lecture about the three outcomes of Gaussian elimination. Gaussian elimination, of course, is the process that we use to solve a linear system of equations by taking that linear system, putting it into an augmented matrix, and using elementary row operations to bring that matrix into row echelon form. It turns out that there are sort of three different scenarios that can come up in the process of doing Gaussian elimination. And I'm gonna do three examples right now to show you those three different outcomes. And not to spoil all of the fun, it turns out that the most important thing that determines which outcome arises for a particular problem is the positions of the pivots in the row echelon form. This is the key, okay? So let's look at three examples and let's pay particular attention to what happens with the pivots in the row echelon form. So here's the first one. I have a system of three equations with three unknowns, x, y, and z. And the first step, as we always would do, is to put this system into an augmented matrix. So let me just do that here. So for the solution, I'm simply going to build this matrix A sharp, which would look like this. We just simply grab the coefficients of the system and we place them into this matrix. And so this is what we're going to end up with. All right. And our next job is to reduce this matrix into row echelon form. So I already have a pivot in the upper left corner of this matrix, which is great. And so what I'm going to do next is simply do A12 of negative 3 and A13 of negative 1. These two elementary row operations will zero out the two numbers that are below this top pivot. And that's what we need to do because the lower rows need to have pivots that are further to the right. Okay? So let's just do these two operations. We can do them together. The first row will stay exactly the same as before, but I'm going to now take negative three times the first row and add that to the second row, and I should get zero, 10, negative 10, and zero. Okay? And then when I take the negative of the first row and add it to the bottom row, I get zero, four, negative four, and zero. <laughs> okay. All right. And now uh, I would suggest that we multiply row two by one tenth. So the first row again just gets recopied the same, but the second row gets cut down by a factor of 10. And then I'm going to leave the third row alone. I don't like to mix EROs that are of different types. Some of you might already be wanting to just add the negative four times the middle row to the bottom row and doing that here. I don't like to mix different types of EROs together because it can get a little confusing as to like which one you did first and second and third and it makes a difference. If the, if the EROs are, are of a different type, then doing them in a different order is going to be confusing. For example, suppose I permuted two rows right here then the A12 and the A13 would be a little bit ambiguous. Are those subscripts referring to the rows before you switched to other rows or after, right? So I recommend, uh, you can combine these kind of operations without too much trouble, the A operation, but I don't recommend combining other EROs together in one single step. It's just more likely to uh, lead to mistakes or be confusing for, for anybody. But now I will go ahead and do a two, three of negative four. And this is going to give me the following matrix here. And so the first and second rows are already good to go. And now we have zeroed out the last row. What I want you to notice here, guys, about the pivots is that, first of all, we have an unpivoted column. And remember that these pivots correspond, or sorry, these columns correspond to the unknowns in the system. So Z is actually free. 
because it does not have a pivot on it. We have a free variable here. So I'm going to call that free variable t, and so z is just equal to t. If I look at the middle row, so I'm going to try to now work my way backwards, the middle row is really just the equation x, sorry, y minus z equals zero, right? So this row is simply that equation right there. And that just tells me that y is equal to z. So in other words, y is also equal to t. y and z are the same. Finally, I have to figure out what x is. And I can even just, the first row of this matrix is still just the first equation that we started with up here. So I can literally solve for x here. And if I do that, I'm going to get 4y minus 2z minus 3. And if I <clears throat> go ahead now, and so this is just solving for x. If I now go ahead and plug in t for y and for z, well, what I'll end up with is 4t minus 2t, which is 2t minus 3. Okay, so x is equal to 2t minus 3. So my answer that I would report would be written as follows. The solution would be the set of 2t minus 3, that's the x value, right? And then y is t, and z is t. And this is such that t is an element of the real numbers. Okay? So for this example, notice that we have a free variable. That's because, that's because we have an unpivoted column here. This third column does not have a pivot. All right, so that's a good observation. So in fact, if we think about it, the number of solutions in this case is we have infinitely many solutions for this example, and that's because of the free variable, right? I can choose t to be any number that I want, and it'll be a valid solution. Okay, let's do a second example to show a second situation. I'm going to make this really easy, okay? I'm just going to make two equations with just two unknowns. It's going to be a very simple system. Let's suppose we have x plus y equals 2 and x plus y equals 3. That's it. All right. If you put that into an augmented matrix, it's going to look like this. Very easy, right? And all I have to do is one elementary row operation here. I'm going to take the negative of the first row and add it to the bottom row. First row stays the same. Bottom row, when I take the negative of it and add it to the, when I take the negative of the first row and add it to the bottom row, I just get zero, zero, and one. Now, if I circle my pivots in this case, notice what has happened. We have a pivot in the far right column. This is really bad. Because actually, if you were to take this second row and write it as an equation in terms of x and y, what would it be? It would be 0 times x plus 0 times y equals 1. In other words, 0 equals 1. And this is impossible. This is a inconsistent situation, right? This, this example has no solutions. There are no solutions here. These are just two parallel lines. If you were to draw these two lines on a xy plane, you would see they never cross. If they never cross, then there's no values of x and y that can satisfy that system. So remember, this just means it's inconsistent. Okay, so in this example, getting a pivot in the far right column is really the issue. Pivot in far right column. That is why this is inconsistent. Okay, so Gaussian elimination will expose inconsistencies, and they get exposed by exactly this method. You get a row of zeros with a pivot beyond that bar in that far right column. Okay, let's do one more example. Um, 
I think I will, I'll go ahead and erase the first one here. I don't really need this at this point. We'll just do one more because there's, so we, we've done two examples. The first one had infinitely many solutions, right? Infinitely many solutions. Now we have an example with no solutions. So there's one more scenario. You probably already have an idea what it is, but let me just show you with an example. Again, I'm going to use a really easy example because I just want to get the concept across. So um, I guess I can just start all the way at the top here. Okay, so here's one more example. Example three. Let's just take x plus y equals two again, but this time let's take x minus y equals three. So I'm not really changing a whole lot from the previous example. I just want to choose something easy. Let's once again write out our augmented matrix. This is A sharp. And let's do A12 of negative one again. So we leave the first row the same. We take the negative of the first row and add it to the second row. Get something like that. And I guess we need one more step on that second row. I'm going to multiply by, I guess, by negative one half. So we're going to get something like this. So this one is m2 of negative one half. And now, look what you have this time. You do not have a pivot all the way in the far right column. That's a good thing. But you also have no free variables. So if you were to write these out as a set of equations now, here's what you would have. And y is not associated with a free variable. It actually has a specific value. And then from that y value, we can solve for x using the first equation. And I believe we're going to get five halves out of that. So this is therefore the solution. We have just one specific solution. And this also makes sense if you think about it. These are two lines that have different slopes. Okay, these are not parallel lines. Two lines that have different slopes are going to cross in exactly one point. And that's this point right here. So the, the conclusion here, guys, is that every linear system, every linear system has either zero, one, or infinitely many solutions. These are the only, the only three possibilities. Okay, so, and it's all based on how the pivots line up. So zero solutions, that would happen if you get a pivot in the far right column. That would be no solutions. One solution would be that there are no unpivoted columns except the far right column. So there's no, no unpivoted columns. This really just means no free variables. So we don't have any free variables. And that's this third example. See, x is not free, y is not free. When you think about the, the columns of this row echelon form. Okay. Finally, infinitely many solutions. This will happen if there are free variables. So you have free variables, free variables coming from unpivoted columns. You still don't have a, a pivot in the far right column. Okay, that's always a situation of an inconsistent system. So there's no pivot in the far right column, but here you also have at least some columns to the left of the far right column that are also unpivoted because that gives you free variables that are associated with those unpivoted columns. So these are three outcomes of Gaussian elimination. It all comes down 
to row reducing our matrix, our augmented matrix, right? And looking at how the pivots are laying out into the different columns of that matrix. That's really the key, the pivots and the columns. We're gonna see that theme a lot in linear algebra. I thought I would just share it with you today to help you kind of understand the, the sort of scope of what can happen in these uh, Gaussian elimination problems where you're solving linear systems. I hope it makes sense. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for, for your attention. And we'll see you guys again soon. Bye for now.